to tell you will shock your belief system and make you see that the stories told about gods are real. And it's all thanks to one book. The Book of Gilgamesh, or as it is famously called, the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh is one of the great works of literature and one of the oldest. It was written in the Akkadian tongue in ancient Mesopotamia and the early 2nd millennium BC. The story is split into 11 books, which add up to about 3,000 words, and yet, in those 3,000 words, it captivates you. It's a story about love and friendship, pride and doubt, smarts and foolishness, haste and determination, eternal life, and the fact that everyone will die. Bukun introduces Gilgamesh. He is a wise and knowledgeable king who has traveled a great deal and learned about everything. He possesses superhuman capacities, part god, part human. He's described as a giant with a height of 17 feet, great strength and power when compared to humans, and as if all these were not good enough in their own way, he was described as one of the most beautiful beings to ever exist. Basically, he had everything. But there is just one thing wrong with our hero. He is very arrogant and full of tyranny. He treats his workers as slaves and makes them work until exhaustion. King Gilgamesh was the king of Uruk and a Sumerian king. Uruk was once the biggest city in the world. It was once located on the old course of the Euphrates in modern-day southern Iraq. Gilgamesh ruled over the city of Uruk and its people, but with an iron fist. No young man could go back to their parents. He sleeps with women on their wedding nights, and some can't even go back to their husbands. Basically, our hero was a villain, and this was a demigod that was strong and tall, so nobody could stand up to him. The people only had one choice, and that was to pray to Anu, the sky god, for help. Luckily, their prayers were answered. The gods created a primitive man known as Enkidu, and this man was given strength that could rival Gilgamesh. Like the second creation story of people in Genesis 2, Enkidu is made from the clay of the ground, from somewhere known as the Outback, which in Sumerian means Eden. The first person to see Enkidu was a hunter, who saw him naked, drinking with wild animals and different beasts at their watering holes, basically hanging out with them. He didn't know much about society, or right or wrong. The hunter runs to Gilgamesh to tell him what he just saw. Gilgamesh decides to send Shamhat, a courtesan, to deceive and tame Enkidu. Shamat assumes a maternal role as she sets out to domesticate and integrate Enkidu. She covers up Enkidu's nakedness and leads him like a child to a shepherd's camp. Enkidu eats cooked food and gets drunk, which are as much a part of the human experience as making love, wearing clothing, listening to music, and participating in and devising ceremonies. Basically falling deeper and deeper into the trap set by Gigamesh. No longer the champion of the wild animals, Enkidu, now fully human, becomes their enemy as he guards the camp from their attacks. After this, the animals start to run from him, and Enkidu now knows that he is no longer welcome in the land of Eden. So he leaves. A stranger comes into camp one day, resting before continuing his journey. The woman is asked by Enkidu to find out who he is and where he is going. The man tells them that he is going to Uruk to bring gifts to a wedding and to give gifts to Gilgamesh even though he is not the groom. The man then says that King Gilgamesh will sleep with the woman before her husband does, even though he is not the groom. No one can stop Gilgamesh's power. He gets whatever he wants. This upset Enkidu a lot, and rightfully so. Who does that? So Enkidu goes Uruk to challenge Gilgamesh. At Uruk, when Enkidu shows up, everyone is shocked to see a man who is just as beautiful and big as Gilgamesh. They swarm around him and praise him as their hero. Enkidu finds his way to Gilgamesh to fight him. The two gigantic men fight each other and wrestle through the streets. The walls of the city tremble and the doorposts shake as they fight. They fight until they can't move. At last, Enkidu is finally pinned to the ground by Gilgamesh, who is stronger. But instead of Gilgamesh hating Enkidu for defying him, he ends up liking him, loving him as a brother, so much so that he introduces Enkidu to his mother, Ninsun, his only family. Now, Enkidu sees that Gilgamesh has no family or no one aside from his mother, 
And right now, at this point of this story, Gilgamesh, to me, starts to look like a kid throwing a tantrum just to get attention that he never has. Enkidu himself was impressed that there was someone else who could not only stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, but pin him down. Weirdly enough, they became best friends. Enkidu agrees with Gilgamesh that he should be king of Uruk and promises to be loyal to him. Ninsun adopts Enkidu as her son, who will protect his new brother. One day, Gilgamesh suggests a fun activity for them both. They should go on an epic trip to the great cedar forest and fight Humbaba, the guardian that the god Enlil put there, just for fun. When they got to the forest, they were amazed by the tall cedars. But Shamash, the sun god, quickly convinces them to fight Humbaba while he is still unaware and only has one of his seven auras to protect him. Humbaba learns about the arrival of intruders in the forest and approaches them. A confrontation leads to a fight between the three demigods. The fight starts, and the three fighters' fighting power breaks the mountain in two. The battle goes on until Shamash, the sun god, sends 13 winds to tip the scales in Gilgamesh's favor. Humbaba can't move and can't see, and he is held down by Gilgamesh. He starts to beg for his life. But Enkidu tells him to ignore what he says. Instead, Enkidu tells Gilgamesh to kill him quickly so that the gods, especially Enlil, don't get mad when they hear about what they did. Humbaba puts a curse on his captors. This curse, like the Cyclops in the Odyssey, has ominous consequences. May they not. May the pair of them never grow old. Apart from his friend Gilgamesh, may Enkidu have nobody to bury him. This makes Enkidu angry and he tells Gilgamesh to kill him, and this time Gilgamesh listens. Gilgamesh gets a sword and stabs Humbaba in the neck. As soon as they get back to Uruk, the goddess of love, Ishtar hears about the brave act and comes to ask Gilgamesh to marry her. He answers by telling her about the sad endings of her past lovers and clearly turns her down. Ishtar is very angry, so she tells her father Anu that she wants the Bull of Heaven, a strong animal, just like the Kraken of Greek mythology, to get back at Gilgamesh. She tells him she will open the gates to the underworld if he doesn't give in, so Anu releases the Bull of Heaven. She then takes the bull to Uruk to destroy the city. A huge pit opens up every time it snorts and many men fall in. But Gilgamesh and Enkidu fight the bull and kill it. After killing it, Enkidu throws a body part at Ishtar. While they're celebrating, Ishtar appears and they mock her again, which they shouldn't have done. You don't insult people or beings higher than you? The gods retaliated not just for the insult, but for the killing of Hambaba and cursed Enkidu with a mysterious illness. After several weeks of being sick, he dies, and Gilgamesh and the whole city of Uruk mourn Enkidu. Gilgamesh is now distraught about losing his best friend, and also knows that death is a possibility for him. He is not as invincible as he once thought, and this bothers him. So he chooses to find a remedy to prevent him from ever dying, and his search leads him to Utanapishti, the immortal. When Gilgamesh tells Uta Napishti about his adventures, Uta Napishti answers back by saying that he is being silly. Uta Napishti tells Gilgamesh that he should be taking care of his people as king, not doing the impossible. Uta Napishti tells him that he can't avoid death. The gods have decided that everyone will die, and that can't be changed. However, due to his persistence, Uta Napishti gives in and tells him that if he wants to live forever, he must first master sleep by staying awake for seven days and six nights. Right away, Gilgamesh falls asleep. While he sleeps, Uta Napishti has his wife bake bread every day and put it in front of Gilgamesh. Uta Napishti can show Gilgamesh that he has been asleep for six days and seven nights by showing him how each loaf of bread has gone bad, with one being worse than the last. Gilgamesh has come to terms with the fact that he will die if he can't beat sleep. Despite his failure, Uta Napishti still decides to help him one more time and tells Gilgamesh about a plant that can bring life back to the world. It grows in the sweet water below the ground, so Gilgamesh puts stones on his feet, jumps down to the river, and successfully gets it. He then leaves, making his way back to his land. On his way, Gilgamesh decides to take a bath, and that is when a devious snake steals the plant, eats it, and then rejuvenates itself by shedding its skin. 
Gilgamesh has missed his one chance to stay young forever. He accepts his fate of dying and goes back to Uruk with only his experience. He returns to Uruk as a wiser and better man. What a story, right? Netflix is sleeping on it if they don't make this into a movie. But what if I told you that all what I just said wasn't a story, but it actually happened? If anything, the story I just told could be me giving you history lessons. Archaeologists and historians have been trying to show that the real Gilgamesh existed for hundreds of years. In the 19th century, for the first time, Austin Henry Lanyard found evidence proving that the Epic of Gilgamesh is more than just a story. When he was digging in the old city of Nineveh in 1849, he found a lot of artifacts and writing. One of the most important things he found was the Ashurbanipal's libraries. The libraries of Ashurbanipal is the world's largest library that is organized. There are lots of information in its books, including many cuneiform tablets that have been kept safe for thousands of years and were found in ancient Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq. This was the best place to learn about Assyrian society, laws, behaviors, and beliefs. That was how he found the pieces of tablets that turned out to be from the tale of Gilgamesh, which is the oldest known tale, and what I just told you. Parts of the poem that were found in the library were written in Akkadian, a language used by the Assyrian and Babylonian empires. This sparked a new interest in Mesopotamian culture and how little we know about it. So, people were using these tales to find out more about the civilization of ancient Mesopotamia until a major breakthrough occurred in 2003. In 2003, German archaeologists led a mission that found the actual tomb of Gilgamesh. It was found near the ancient city of Uruk in Iraq. Magnetometry techniques at first helped the archaeologists find a unique structure under the water. After digging, they discovered that the structure was a tomb. The most interesting thing was that the Epic of Gilgamesh already talked about the buildings that were discovered in Uruk. There were gardens, markets, and homes at the buried spot. They found garden and field buildings that were just like the Epic said they would be. The most interesting discovery was a complex network of canals that showed how advanced the city of Uruk was. The site is often called Venice in the Desert because of the large and complicated network of canals that were found there. That's not a coincidence. That's a roadmap to finding lost treasures marked at X. The story was a Google map to finding the real city. There are many connections between the tomb and what is described in the Epic of Gilgamesh. In such, according to the epic or story, the tomb was kept on the banks of the Euphrates River, which is exactly where the real tomb was found. Inside the tomb, there was a big burial chamber with more inscriptions and artifacts. One of the inscriptions talked about Bill Games, which is the Sumerian name for Gilgamesh. This is why a lot of people believe the tomb found is the real tomb. There were also references to Enkidu, who was Gilgamesh's best friend. Tablets were found that talked about their friendship and travels. Lion statues were placed around the room, which may have something to do with Gilgamesh's battle against Humbaba, whose face looked like a lion. One of the rooms contained botanical samples that some scientists and scholars believe could be the rejuvenation plant mentioned in the Epic of Gilgamesh and may have been placed in his tomb as an offering. Now, why this isn't reported as much as it should be is because there are no records of it. Now, let me explain what I mean. The U.S. invaded Iraq just a few weeks after this huge discovery, so the researchers had to stop their research. War was going on. The government sent everyone home, including researchers and reporters. It's war, so anything goes. Some people say they saw the U.S. military digging in the area where the tomb was found. At the same time, the Iraq National Museum in Baghdad, which is Iraq's most important museum and has some of the most interesting artifacts and texts ever found, was robbed. Most of the thefts were done by regular thieves, but some people say they saw U.S. troops loading trucks with things from inside. When a group of experts went to check out what had been stolen, they saw that gold coins and irreplaceable old artifacts, which are the most valuable things in terms of money, had not been taken. This made the experts think that the thieves were looking for something specific, which brings up a bigger question. What did they steal? 
So why this didn't make the headlines all over the world was because of the war taking the spotlight and also because the records that could have given more claim to these stories were either stolen or destroyed. Another piece of human history is gone forever, 